Those of you who are interested on the panel on cybersecurity policy and implementation, I will uh, introduce our panelists for this, uh, for this panel. First, Ron Diebert is a, prof a professor of political science and the director of the Canada Centre for Global Security Studies oh, and the Citizen Lab at the Monk okay. School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Ron is the author, the author of Parchment, Printing and Hypermedia, Communications in World Order Transformation and is... You can skip all of that. Oh, well, I'll just say that your most recent book, Black oh, Code sorry, Inside the Battle the for Cyberspace, is currently a bestseller. Welcome. Thank you. Frédéric Gaudreau. Frédéric est responsable de l'unité du cybercrime à la Sûreté du Québec. Il veille à la planification, à l'organisation, à la gestion et au contrôle des activités de lutte contre la cybercriminalité au sein de la Sûreté du Québec. Bienvenue, M. Gaudreau. Third, Matthew Johnson. Matthew is the Director of Education for Media Smarts. In this role, he creates uh, digital media literacy resources for educators, parents, and community groups. Matthew is an educator with more than 10 years' experience teaching media education, filmmaking, English, and special education, among other subjects. Bienvenue. Enfin, M. Michel Vanier, qui se joint aussi à nous, qui est chef de la direction du réseau d'information scientifique du Québec, le RISC, depuis 2004. Michel euh, profite d'une solide expérience et a suivi un long parcours en gestion des technologies de l'information et des communications dans le domaine de l'éducation et de la recherche. Ses diverses fonctions lui ont permis d'explorer toutes les facettes des TI. Il est membre du Conseil de Canary et président du Conseil consultatif de l'Alliance canadienne des réseaux évolués. Et puis, comme ce fut le cas ce matin, Martin Lessard euh, va agir comme modérateur de ce panel. Et je vous cède la parole, Martin. Merci. Merci, Eric. Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, sachant que Internet devient de plus en plus inscrit dans le tissu social, donc les dangers qui viennent du réseau peuvent avoir de graves conséquences sur nos vies, notre société, notre culture. On, on l'a vu ce matin, effectivement, qu'on discutait beaucoup sur le, le, la surveillance, les récents scandales autour de la surveillance à grande échelle concernent à la fois la technologie, les lois aussi, mais aussi la confiance qu'on peut avoir envers les lois et la technologie. Uh, Byron talked about surveillance, uh, surveillance to protect us from terrorism, and he says, what about this definition? What's, what's the name of terrorism? So, de quel danger parlons-nous? Parlons What is at stake when we talk about cyber, cyber attack or uh, uh, cyber security, uh, cyber security and policy? What that means? So, cyber security means maybe different things depending on who you are talking to. So, I will ask the panelists to take maybe one or two minutes to uh, present themselves or their organization and uh, uh, maybe talk about how important is cybersecurity for you uh, uh, from your st uh, standpoint, what is your role in, in the security and safety on online uh, uh, world. Uh, so uh, I will start with you, Don. Okay. So, uh, no, you can stay oh, there. Can stay here. So okay. present yourself one or two minutes. Sure, okay. And if I go beyond one or two minutes, oh, let me know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so I am director of Citizen Lab, and uh, I, for the last 10 years, Citizen Lab has been um, involved in many different areas of cybersecurity research. I think many people know us for our work on uh, uncovering global cyber espionage networks, especially our GhostNet report. Um, we've also done work on, on cybercrime. Uh, we had a major report on Kubeface, which was a uh, criminal operation that was targeting uh, Facebook users, but primarily our focus is on human rights organizations and NGOs in the global south. Uh, so we, we've been a kind of uh, early warning system, is the way I would put it. We've seen trouble brewing on the horizon in this area, and I think we're one of the few organizations that has experience that can cross both uh, the traditional criminal espionage, warfare uh, side of the equation, as well as the human rights and the open internet side. Um, my main comment with respect to this panel, and it, I think it reflects the fact that I'm a political scientist, I'm not a technologist, is we need to begin this discussion by asking security for whom and security for what. Uh, often this is completely uh, neglected or presupposed or, or assumed. 
but it matters. And it matters for several reasons. I'll say one thing. Um, there is a tendency, I think, whenever any area gets securitized or is talked about in terms of security, there is a tendency to default to a certain position, which I call the realist approach. And that tends to privilege certain policy responses, secrecy, uh, three-letter agencies, military approaches, uh, building borders to the outside world and all of that. Um, that's one approach. It's not the only approach, though, to a, to a domain so complex and go global as cyberspace. In fact, I think it may be incongruous to it. And so uh, we urgently need to explore alternative approaches to cybersecurity because I think that approach, which is dominating today, is ultimately not in our best interest or in the interest of the internet. Thank you very much. Monsieur Gaudreau, de votre point de vue, est-ce que vous faites, euh, si vous pouvez nous parler pendant une ou deux minutes? Oui, en fait, euh, la Sûreté du Québec a pour mission, euh, d'une part, hein, de, 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 de protéger la population en matière de, de criminalité et de tenter de prévenir également euh, l'ensemble de la criminalité, mais principalement en matière de cybercriminalité, euh, je pourrais dire que euh, nous, euh, la première euh, mission, évidemment, c'est de prévenir euh, des victimes euh, de cybercrimes. Et, euh, et, et lorsqu'on a euh, à répondre à une plainte où euh, une victime a été euh, donc euh, victime d'un cybercrime, on se doit d'avoir la capacité euh, de retracer euh, la personne qui euh, a fait euh, donc euh, cette victime-là. Alors, ça nous prend des outils et une législation euh, qui, nous, euh, qui nous permet euh, d'avoir accès à l'information euh, dans le cadre, évidemment, d'une enquête, euh, enquête criminelle, d'une enquête réelle. Et c'est avec ça qu'on est en mesure, donc, euh, d'intervenir et d'être efficace euh, sur la toile. Alors, essentiellement, euh, le message que je peux passer aujourd'hui, c'est euh, l'image de la police euh, est parfois entachée euh, par euh, des... Euh, on pourrait dire des révélations euh, de programmes d'espionnage, euh, alors que notre mission réelle, euh, il faut euh, la ramener, si on veut, et je prends l'analogie qui était utilisée euh, auparavant, il faut la ramener euh, dans notre cours euh, et, et donc euh, de tenter d'éviter d'associer toujours les gestes qui sont faits par les policiers à du cyberespionnage, donc à se limiter à l'intervention auprès des victimes et, et donc de concrètement être en mesure d'utiliser des outils qui sont disponibles sur Internet pour retracer euh, donc, les suspects euh, qui sont à l'origine de ces cybercrimes-là. Si on peut résumer au, au fond, ce que vous dites, c'est que c'est toujours la poursuite euh, contre le crime, mais à travers un nouveau canal, finalement. C'est pas vous ne changez pas nécessairement d'outils, c'est juste le, le, le terrain qui change. Oui. Euh, Mr. Johnson, if you want to present yourself. So, Media Smarts is a national Canadian non-profit organization, uh, and we're dedicated to ensuring that children and youth have the necessary critical thinking skills that they need to understand and actively engage with all forms of media. So our approach to cybersecurity and all sorts of online issues comes from that place, which is to say that we start from a position of teaching kids digital literacy, providing parents, teachers, community groups, law enforcement, and other sectors with the tools they need to make sure that young people develop the critical thinking skills, the specific skills they need to deal with issues online such as recognizing scams, protecting their privacy, uh, recognizing and confronting online hate speech, and finally the ability to make the necessary ethical choices that they have to online. So in a way it's, a, it's basically behavior and to know, to, to, to be aware of the new behavior online uh, where to go and where not to go in a way. It's really a matter of getting kids in the position to make the right decisions and preparing them uh, for those times when they have to make those decisions. Thanks. Monsieur Vanier. Oui, mon expérience est davantage au niveau de l'élaboration de politiques de sécurité et de leur mise en application. Euh, pour nous, une politique de sécurité, ça commence par définir des objectifs basé sur les besoins à rencontrer, euh, tout en gérant les risques. Alors, malheureusement, il n'y a pas de solution unique ou de solution facile en matière de politique de sécurité. Si je considère maintenant l'expérience du risque, qui est un réseau de télécommunications 
privée au service de l'éducation et de la recherche euh, au Québec, ben, le premier élément de la politique, l'ABC de tout réseau de télécommunications, c'est qu'il faut assurer le bon fonctionnement du réseau, même en cas d'attaque majeure. Alors, s'il y a un établissement, une université, un collège qui fait l'objet d'une attaque, il faut s'assurer que le réseau va continuer à fonctionner pour les sans quelques autres établissements d'enseignement et qu'on va les aider à disposer de cette attaque-là. Il faut bien comprendre que, euh, vu de l'extérieur, on va dire le réseau de l'éducation, euh, ça serait facile, certains diraient que ce serait facile d'établir une politique commune. Ce n'est pas le cas. Le réseau de l'éducation n'est pas homogène. Euh, on a les universités qui ont des besoins et des contraintes très différentes des écoles primaires et secondaires. Et du côté de la recherche, bien, les politiques de sécurité devraient favoriser la recherche, permettre la recherche et non pas l'entraver. Conclusion rapide, bien, ce qui importe dans le cas du risque, uh, uh, or let me say a few words in English uh, to summarize what I just said. Uh, what is important for a private telecom uh, operator like RISC? Uh, it's to understand the diverse needs of the educational sector it serves. Uh, and to clarify the respective roles and responsibilities of risk uh, and the, in the educational institutions. The policy and security services, uh, from our point of view, have to be mutually agreed. Thank you very much. As you can see, I guess, like, we may have a different definition of what is uh, cybersecurity. I mean, at, at some point, it's, uh, it's, it's the same thing, but Make sure that we are all on the same page. I'm going to ask you one clear question. So, my première question, ce serait de savoir si il y aurait une problématique de cybersécurité uh, canadienne. So, if is there some specific weak point in Canada that makes cybersecurity a really critical issue for all of us, or is it something that is the same thing for all the world? So, who wants to jump on that question to start and break the glass? Go ahead. Ahead, if you don't mind. Be my guest. Uh, well, I think, uh, first of all, you can generalize about Canada in the way that you can most other advanced industrialized countries that depend on the internet and global telecommunications. We're subject to uh, daily, regular, persistent cyber attacks. And most of this is directed at the private sector. And of course, most of what we talk about in terms of cyberspace is owned and operated by the private sector. So like most advanced industrialized countries, we have a difficult coordination problem between public and private sector. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the people who have experience in law enforcement could, could speak more authoritatively uh, about that. I also think though that uh, we've yet to address fully uh, and comprehensively what should be the different roles uh, and responsibilities for different agencies within Canada that deal with cybersecurity. So you have law enforcement, uh, you have uh, provincial law enforcement, federal security services, you have signals intelligence agencies. Uh, the elephant in the room that I think we should obviously bring up in light of the Snowden revelations. Um, I think that we have a ma uh, mammoth uh, cyber, uh, cyber signals intelligence agency um, building a new headquarters in Ottawa, 800 million plus, um, but very little accountability over it. And I think that is not only bad public policy, bad for civil liberties and privacy in Canada, potentially bad for the abuse of power in Canada as well, which is very rarely mentioned. Usually it's juxtaposed with uh, privacy alone. But more importantly, it's bad for international policy, for foreign policy. Uh, I have an op-ed today in the Globe and Mail about the uh, backdoors and the wireless uh, standards auction uh, that I would encourage people to read if they're interested in that topic, because one of the examples I bring up there is precisely about how the international consequences of this could come home to roost for us. Uh, Blackberry, uh, whose product is most well known for its uh, much vaunted security, has been um, chased by one country after another in the global south uh, who demand that Blackberry turn over its encryption keys in order to operate uh, in, in their jurisdictions. Uh, reportedly, BlackBerry has reached an agreement with India 
where, we'll, where they will do exactly this. Um, I think, uh, you know, from a foreign policy point of view, that's something that Canada, along with other countries in the Freedom Online Coalition, would condemn. And yet we're doing the same thing here in Canada. Uh, so we have to get our own house in order. And that uh, requires us to take a step back and ask, security for whom? Security for what? And then start defining which missions, which agencies should be assigned uh, to the proper roles for those missions. Thank you very much. Can we have a question, Mr. Vanier? There's another obvious if, I think. It's, uh, it, it's about uh, internet exchange points. Uh, we happen to manage one of Canada's internet exchange points, the Quebec Internet Exchange. And currently, uh, very often, national traffic, Canadian traffic, goes through south of the border, goes through another country, and is subject to the laws of that other country, well, very well known indeed. And uh, by having more internet exchange points here in Canada, we can have that local traffic subject only to Canada's and the province's laws and uh, jurisdictions. So I think you, you get the point, at least it means we can control something at that point so we can apply our own law. Peut-être vous voulez rajouter quelque chose là-dessus? Parce qu'au fond, votre, votre, le crime, au fond, dépasse les frontières, mais est-ce que d'une certaine manière, il y a quelque chose de particulier au Canada que vous avez vu, que vous sentez? En fait, le, le point soulevé par, par mes collègues ici, très important, c'est qu'on a souvent l'image du Canada comme étant un pays exemplaire euh, à l'extérieur, autant, dans, en fait, bon, historiquement, là, on encore euh, circuler librement avec un passeport canadien sans euh, s'exposer sans à, à des critiques euh, à l'extérieur, mais cette ligne est très mince et je crois que nous sommes euh, actuellement un, un point tournant euh, des choses, euh, le, le danger de s'associer certainement à certains programmes euh, internationaux, mais la réalité est la suivante, c'est que euh, si je prends un exemple concret de, 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 de crime, donc d'une victime, par exemple, du Canada, qui, qui est victime d'un cybercrime, fort, fort est à constater que la plupart du temps, le suspect vient de l'étranger. Alors, le, et, et, et la difficulté d'appliquer la loi lorsque euh, ça dépasse la juridiction euh, du pays est extrêmement complexe. En, en fait, c'est que avec certains pays, ça fonctionne mieux que d'autres. C'est compliqué Mais, parce que c'est Internet ou parce que c'est le type de crime? Euh, c'est que chaque pays dispose de sa propre législation. Mmh. Et l'Internet est mondial. Alors, déjà là, il y a, il y a quelque chose qui ne fonctionne pas euh, dans l'application de la loi. Et pour nous, c'est un défi quotidien euh, lorsque vient le temps d'utiliser l'infrastructure d'Internet pour retracer des gens euh, dans le cadre légal du Canada. Donc, et et c'est là le défi. Alors, nécessairement, ça implique que euh, les, les services policiers du Canada euh, se doivent de d'être assez ingénieux pour trouver des moyens, justement, de retracer l'information. Alors là, il y a un problème technologique, je dirais, qui est combiné avec le, le juridique, qui fait en sorte que le travail est extrêmement difficile. Maintenant, il faut toujours faire attention, et, euh, et je reprends les propos euh, qui ont été mentionnés, euh, sur la définition de la cybersécurité ou du cybercrime. Euh, il n'y a pas vraiment de définition euh, universelle. Hein, donc euh, euh, je crois qu'il euh, faut faire preuve de leadership au Canada, comme on fait dans, dans plusieurs, euh, plusieurs euh, dossiers. Et donc, euh, d'être en mesure nous-mêmes de, de gérer ces problématiques-là, c'est peut-être utopique, mais minimalement, en se donnant des, euh, des guidelines, euh, je crois que ça pourrait être quelque chose qui est possible. Donc, euh, ici au Canada, en termes d'application de la loi, évidemment, et d'application de, de la sécurité, il faut, faut le voir un peu plus large. Donc, euh, la cybersécurité et la cybercriminalité comme étant... Euh, euh, je dirais, euh, bon, très près l'une de l'autre. Merci beaucoup. Do you want to add something, Mr. Johnson? Sure. I, I would say that from our perspective, uh, really what is the weakest point in Canada is the state of education for digital literacy. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a grand project in Canada to connect Canadian schools and communities, libraries as well, to the Internet. Uh, unfortunately, in the last 15 years or so, that's gradually been dismantled. Uh, the last element of it was removed early this year. And at the same time, what was meant to be the follow-up project, which was having a national plan to ensure that all children and youth had the skills they needed to 
get the most out of the internet, including being safe on the internet, uh, has never really materialized. And there are reasons why this connects to cybersecurity, which obviously we define in a slightly different way. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the, the specific skills, but also the habits of being skeptical, cautious, and aware. And these apply in a lot of cases to traditional cybersecurity issues. So just as uh, an example, there were a number of very, very secure uh, institutions that were infiltrated by the simple method of someone having dropped a corrupted USB stick in the parking lot. And people who worked in these places picked up these USB keys and thinking nothing, used them, uh, both on their home computers and at work, uh, and often used them to bring data back and forth. And that's a, one example. An example that's a little bit more a field of what we tend to, tend to think of as cybersecurity, but is definitely in the realm of security, would be what some of the organized hate groups do online. Uh, and one of the things they do today is they, they've developed extremely sophisticated what we call cloaked hate sites. And these are sites that masquerade as legitimate sources of debate, often set themselves up as uh, sources of opinion as well. Uh, and information even, uh, and they use these to get their message across uh, to people who are looking for information, often for school purposes. And it's actually been found that even at the university level, even undergraduates often don't have the skills that they need to recognize these sites for what they are. So that's an example of how critical thinking and digital literacy skills are essential to a lot of the issues that we think of as being security and safety issues. Want to add something, Mr. Beard? Uh, I, just uh, a, another general point to this conversation that I think we shouldn't neglect on the topic of cybersecurity, and that's the political economy dimension of cybersecurity. Uh, there are an endless number of cybersecurity conferences. It's a huge industry now at a time of otherwise financial austerity. Um, major defense contractors are now turning to cybersecurity. Many of them are developing products and services that put in the hands of policymakers tools uh, that they never before imagined. Tools like deep packet inspection, cell phone tracking, uh, how to infiltrate computers remotely and take them over and spy on people. Essentially uh, marketing the tools and tradecraft of cybercrime and professionalizing them and putting them in a brochure and selling them to defense, law enforcement, and so on. Um, this is a worldwide market. And although many of the companies say that they are only restricting their sales to legitimate uh, representatives of governments, uh, the account accountability is really thin in many parts of the global south where the biggest markets are. Uh, and uh, this is a, going to be a major problem because not only does it uh, begin to impinge on internet freedom worldwide, uh, but it also, uh, I think, accelerates an arms race dynamic that we're beginning to see internationally. Uh, so government armed forces uh, are standing up capabilities, including Canada, uh, with cyber commands and so on, to fight and win wars in cyberspace. Whatever you think about the reality of cyber warfare, whether something like that can happen or not, there is this burgeoning political economy around cybersecurity that I think is beginning to qualitatively change the nature of cyberspace in, detriment, in detrimental ways that we need to address. Canadians really should have that uh, front and center uh, because we depend on a global and free open internet more than other countries as, as much as many other countries at the very least. I think the balance is quite hard, but based on what you just said, it means we have like the state uh, cyber warfare, which is a specific may maybe threat, and also some, some criminal, wh which are more individual or m small organization, which are also different. Is there a specific segment of, the popula of our population or institution or maybe territory that is more at risk with the, with the cyber crime or in Canada? Is it educational? Is it specifically dangerous there? Uh, is it um, only military or business? I personally, I wouldn't say that youth are necessarily most at risk, but I would say from our perspective, it's where we can make the most, the biggest difference. Um, and it's the one where we, as a society, have 
the greatest responsibility uh, to teach young people how to look after themselves and how to make wise and ethical decisions when they're online. Yeah, but I heard like, that, that there's some, you are educating them in their minds to be prepared to that, but it means also that based on what you just said, this, this uh, arm race, we also maybe need technology to help us to fight against those criminals. Monsieur Vanier, you want to add something? Uh, je, moi, je suis d'accord avec Matthew sur uh, l'importance de l'éducation. Uh, il ne faut, faut pas s'attacher seulement au, au malware du jour, le, celui qui est le plus à la mode. C'est plus fondamental que ça. Uh, on est la toute première génération dans l'histoire de l'humanité à être exposé à des problèmes de cybersécurité. Et l'éducation, il faut que ça commence très tôt, dès les toutes premières années du primaire. Euh, les, les élèves, nos enfants, puis vos enfants, dans le fond, ils apprennent facilement à utiliser la technologie. Euh, mais, mais utiliser la, la technologie, ou comme on dit, savoir pitonner, c'est une chose, mais faire un bon usage de la, télé, de la technologie, leur apprendre euh, ce que c'est que le le harcèlement, par exemple, les bons comportements par rapport aux mauvais comportements, tout ça, ça s'apprend en jeune âge et c'est là qu'il faut le faire. C'est la meilleure prévention qu'on peut faire. Ensuite, on pourra parler de la technologie, mais elle va continuer à évoluer. Les attaques vont continuer à évoluer, mais le, le bon sens, le bon jugement, ça, ça va rester pour longtemps. Je suis juste Mr. et Gaudreau. Uh, is there a, a, a sufficient uh, a means to educate people or i mean the the criminals or the, the states are stronger than than us so it doesn't worse i mean it's maybe good to make them understand the, the, the youth to understand what's it's at stake but is it really the only thing we shall do is it like uh, they are too uh, strong to beat Show they, all the criminal. I mean, stronger and going to be stronger and stronger. What do you think? Is it sufficient to only think about making them learn about that? Yeah, I think that the balance is really uh, fragile, and uh, we should, as a, a population, for example, I, I'm always using the example that when you 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 just beginning your police career. They are uh, teaching you how to, uh, to educate people about drugs, you know. So we go to the schools and trying to say to, to the kids there, well, just, you know, pay attention to what's going to be uh, in front of you. Sometimes you will have to take a decision about if you, you know, are, are taking drugs or whatever. You can be, well, there's different problems coming with that. Uh, we are starting to do something with the Internet now. I, I think it's really important. Uh, Well, unfortunately or fortunately, the uniform is pretty good for that because sometimes the message is is better understood by the kids. But I think that we have to do some efforts to improve our prevention prevention education programs inside the police services around the country. I'm talking about even even in North America. We I think we should work a lot better to prevent and to educate kids. But we can't do that alone. So we have to, you know, we have to work with with the specialists to, to make sure that uh, our programs are good. And and this is at the kids kids level. Uh, I, I think after that, you know, you can give a driver's license to go into the internet. But you you will still have some you know <laughs> some infractions after. And we can't do nothing about about that if people you know adults they know exactly what they are doing. So we have them to do the other job. Mr. Deeper? Well, I, I would say, you know, cybercrime is a huge issue. There are major constraints, uh, as my colleague pointed out, about working internationally that need to be overcome. Um, I think there's a confusion, especially here in Canada, as to whether law enforcement needs uh, new power and authority or whether they need actually uh, more capabilities, more resources, more training. Mm -hmm. And those are often confused. They're separate things. Uh, most police officers with whom I speak say we, we're under what we're overwhelmed. We don't have enough staff. We can't deal with all of the problems out there. Meanwhile, what is the government doing? Building back doors into our encryption systems, uh, proposing legislation that undermines basic checks and balances to a liberal democracy, installing surveillance equipment at internet service providers that only they have access to. 
I mean, we're, we're talking about in this country positioning agencies that barely acknowledge their own existence as leading cybersecurity. In my opinion, that's wrong. It's contrary to the spirit of liberal democracy. Meanwhile, there are uh, other ways that we could go about uh, approaching cybersecurity problems in a more distributed manner. Certainly law enforcement is essential to that, uh, but the state should monopolize it. Uh, if we, unless we want to completely change the constitution of the internet, which is where we're headed. Oh, the, uh, in a way, you uh, feel that there was a trahison. So, so, so in a way, like you don't feel that you get backed by the government. I mean, uh, the, the defense got all the, the money to do what they have to do, but in a way, the people on the on the ground don't have the tools and the effective to. There, I think there. Sorry, I, I think there's two ways to see, to, to see that. The first one is, yes, unfortunately some, you know, uh, programs like PRISM or whatever, uh, program that, that make the news uh, actually and that infiltrate the, the back doors and the whatever security uh, and the, I think this is one thing. The other thing is uh, we are operating in, in a, legislative environment and uh, we we don't do nothing else than you know go the, the same way that the law is, is requesting us so actually I know that we are requesting for more um, what I'm gonna call that powers you know because we, we 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 need to have access to information and we know that the infrastructure is not um, well is uh, there's inequality around the country for infrastructure so when we go with, to serve a, a a search warrant, for example, to a specific ISP or whatever, sometimes they are saying, well, we don't have the infrastructure to, to give you the information. So that's one thing. The other thing, and I absolutely agree with uh, uh, Robert, is, is the fact that the, 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 you know, the, the big spy programs and uh, the, the cooperation between countries uh, for, for different reasons, uh, this is not our day, oops, sorry, this is not our day-to-day -day work and uh, but in fact, because we are law enforcement, most of the time we just go in that, you know, <laughs> we are identified as the one who wants to go back doors, but in fact, we just want to do our job and a better way to do our job will be to have access to some infrastructure with legal authorization, with a legal, the exact uh, legal uh, pattern that we have actually. So I think it's important to do, uh, to, uh, to to do th that difference, you know, just to make sure that people understand that we have a job to do because we have victims, complainants, so we have to enforce the laws in place. But in a specific uh, way, we need some some powers to, to go to the uh, to change some uh, infrastructure capacities. We're gonna I mean, in five minutes. We're gonna uh, uh, go for the Q and A. I mean, we have uh, maybe one question for you. Like, do you uh, want one of want one of you? know like what's going on and for the next five years uh, do you know that some issue gonna defines the new cyber uh, security new, new cyber crime in the future is there something coming that you want to to share with us that you maybe at the uh, at the infrastructural infrastructure level or maybe a policy level that you know that that's going to be the next big issue in the next five years oh so it's the present level it's it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, right now it's, it's bad enough, so we don't want to add <laughs> to it. So that's the way I understand that. Well, I, I, I will say something again. Uh, I, I think that the emphasis is a bit misplaced when it comes to cybersecurity in this country. It's a very short-sighted view of cybersecurity, focusing almost entirely on domestic issues. Uh, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of internet users come from the global south. And uh, that's not going to change. In fact, that's going to overwhelm us. Mm -hmm. Most of those countries are failed, fragile states, authoritarian regimes. Uh, what are we doing in Canada? Uh, we just eliminated CETA. Uh, some of the uh, efforts around uh, what foreign affairs is doing is notable, but we really don't have yet a stated position on Canada's foreign policy. I think it's fair to say uh, that we're not recognized as a leader, a thought leader when it comes to internet what most people call internet freedom. Uh, I think we need to re redirect our efforts in a big way to international issues and become a player on the world stage because if we don't solve those problems abroad, we'll never be able to solve the cybersecurity issues that are vexing us here in Canada because they're primarily coming from abroad. Mm. 
Monsieur Vanier, vous voulez rajouter quelque chose Ah, je pense que vous êtes en train de nous demander un truc difficile. En train de prédire le futur de l'Internet dans cinq ans de maintenant, wow Je ne vais pas venter dans ça. Ce que je veux dire, c'est que le Canada doit continuer à travailler avec les standards internationales, les organisations de santé organisations. That's the way we're going to improve the basic mechanism of the internet globally. But the internet will remain global. That's what we like with the internet. And it will remain uh, under the jurisdiction of uh, the nation states of the world. That, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> it is. So we are going, going for the Q&A. So there's um, some mic uh, runners here. So who wants to ask a question? There's someone in the front here. And also I have, I see I have some web question too after that. Uh, merci. Um, recently there was an attack at the New York Times uh, and I think Twitter as well. They sort of hacked into the, uh, the, the who is and changed a few parameters. That's right. Um, yeah. In such a circumstance, Um, isn't this a private sector solution where the New York Times deals with his providers to say fix this, someone hacked into your database and, and changed our records? Uh, at what point does the police get involved? Uh, th th does it get involved during the event or is it after the facts once they've collected the, the evidence? Or, or uh, you know, in sort of those types of events that attack private enterprise, is the police needed in this or is, can it do anything? Je crois qu'il y a une façon peut-être peut simple de l'expliquer et, et sans généraliser ou pointer euh, certaines compagnies. Euh, il y a des différentes phases euh, à, à ce niveau-là. La première phase, c'est est-ce que je préserve mon image corporative avant de le dénoncer aux autorités? Parce que euh, l'important de préserver une image corporative, c'est de démontrer à son client qu'on n'est pas vulnérable à des attaques. Et quand on sait que lorsqu'on porte plainte à la police, nécessairement, ça entraîne une ouverture d'une enquête et une possible publication euh, de l'attaque. Nous, on, est, on, est, on peut compter sur les doigts d'une main le nombre de fois où les gens viennent nous rapporter des incidents qui touchent entreprises privées. Maintenant, la problématique actuelle, c'est qu'avant même de décider si on fait faire l'enquête par une entreprise privée ou si on va vers la police, il y a un leak dans l'information et c'est publicisé euh, à l'externe. Alors, l'image corporative, maintenant, on est rendu en, en 2012, 2013, 2014, à se poser des questions sur la rapidité à laquelle l'information est communiquée. Et parfois, ça nuit directement à l'image de l'entreprise le jour même où l'attaque a, a lieu. Alors, nous, la police, même si on est appelé à intervenir pour démarrer une enquête, ou que ce soit la police ou une entreprise privée de sécurité, euh, il y a des conséquences quand même assez importantes sur l'entreprise, sur les clients d'entreprise, mais également sur, euh, je dirais, l'image euh, que, 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 que ça laisse sur la cybersécurité dans son ensemble. Parce que, pour différentes raisons, il y a des groupes qui vont attaquer les infrastructures pour revendiquer ce qu'on appelle le « activisme hein, ». C'est une forme de, de, de revendication. Il y a des groupes également qui vont tenter d'utiliser des failles pour aller chercher de l'information. Alors, où les, la, la police est appelée à intervenir, c'est entre le fait que, est-ce que c'est simplement pour passer un message qu'on a attaqué l'infrastructure, ou c'est pour aller prendre de l'information privée, par exemple, et qui peut mettre à risque des citoyens, des, 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 des gens qui ne sont pas nécessairement l'entreprise. Et je pense que c'est là que l'entreprise, actuellement, se questionne. Et je vous dirais que c'est vraiment du cas par cas, il n'y a pas de recette miracle. Mais où l'entreprise va se questionner, est-ce que maintenant, je, considérant que c'est connu et su de tous, parce que… Par exemple, le New York Times ou euh, Twitter ou peu importe. Maintenant, est-ce que je suis pas mieux d'aller dire à la police, faites quelque chose? Bon, maintenant, ce que la police fait avec, ça, c'est une autre chose. <rire> Mais la, la réalité euh, est qu'on est comme un espèce de, justement, on se posait la question, qu'est-ce qui s'en vient dans les cinq prochaines années? Mais maintenant, là, au moment où on se parle, c'est tout ce, ce questionnement-là sur la, la, la réputation d'une entreprise versus d'engager des poursuites judiciaires. Ça me semble être une question d'éducation au niveau oui. corporatif. Oui à la fois pour le public, qui doit aussi comprendre qu'on est la première génération qui vivons ça. Et donc, on peut, avoir, on peut avoir une bonne réputation partout, mais au niveau informatique, avoir des, des problèmes, mais ça ne doit pas nécessairement nuire, nuire à, à, à l'image de la compagnie. Ça répond à votre question, j'imagine. Avez-vous d'autres questions? Some, there is someone there who wants to ask a question. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, question to uh, Ron Diebert. Um, mostly you've written uh, quite a bit on the fact that the government um, is addressing these global problems on a piecemeal and pretty much inadequate fashion and that um, various efforts don't really connect with each other. What do you think, uh, do you have any suggestions on how, where CIRA can, can be of any assistance? What kinds of, what kinds of help can be provided to an organization like this to resolve those kinds of very serious problems? Well, I, I think that's a very good question. I think CIRA and organizations like it in, in other countries uh, have a special and unique role to play as stewards of, of the original conception of the internet and I think uh, hearing the announcement earlier today uh, was a very good uh, thing, in my opinion, to encourage uh, not just technical projects, but research and policy engagement uh, that uh, puts forward alternative conceptions of things like cybersecurity uh, so that uh, the discourse isn't uh, monodimensional and in the way it is now. Um, so I would like to see CIRA using some of its resources to ensure that Canadian civil society, and by that I mean uh, government, uh, non-government organizations and university researchers are uh, able to participate in forums at an international level and exercise uh, their voice as stakeholders. Uh, we all are in favor of the multi-stakeholder <laughs> approach, but in principle only seemingly. Um, it's very difficult for civil society organizations to actually engage when they don't have the resources to do so in the first place. And forums tend to be dominated, not surprisingly, by the private sector and government. I think that really needs to change. Uh, I think government has a responsibility as well in this regard. But in terms of what CIRA can do, I think it's ensuring and nurturing that there's a healthy, vibrant debate coming from Canadians and good, based on good, solid, independent research at the universities. I know that sounds self-serving, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a web question here, and I uh, hope you're going to be able to answer th that one because I think it's uh, something we, we talk about all, the, all day long. It's, uh, do we have any solid ideas about how to enforce oversight and transparency within government agencies, such as the CSEC, without risking our security? I think ACA being in the next Snowden. Uh, it's, I, it's, it's a I'll tough, it's a tough, yeah. I have ideas, if none, <laughs> none of you want to go, I will go. I okay. can't answer that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me answer. Uh, well, look, the, the, the issue, I think, uh, until recently, I mean, I begin my book saying most Canadians have never even heard of CSEC. I used to begin my lectures asking how many people have heard of CSIS, mm -hmm. everyone puts up their hand. How many people have heard of CSE? No one. Mm -hmm. Well, that's changed. I think that's, that's uh, one important step to take. Uh, but it's remarkable that there is this huge uh, agency that most Canadians until recently had no idea of. Um, if you spend a bit of time examining it, uh, this agency needs secrecy to operate. There has to be a degree of secrecy around what it does given the nature of its mission. Uh, however, there has to also be accountability. And the question Canadians have to ask themselves is whether our accountability mechanisms are appropriate. For, the, for an advanced liberal democracy? I do not think so. Uh, it, our, our accountability pales in comparison to what is going on even down in the United mm -hmm. States, which is going through this uh, exercise of, of uh, self-examination about the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. Here in Canada, what do we have? We have a commissioner that issues an annual report. It's a retired judge. Uh, in the entire time, uh, that this uh, oversight body has been issuing annual reviews, not once until just recently, and I'll speak about that, have they identified a, a, any problem whatsoever, maybe a missing stapler or too many <laughs> pencils or something? <laughs> Nothing, uh, I find that remarkable. Uh, and then when they do issue a rare public review, interestingly, after the Snowden revelations, it's a bombshell. The commissioner tells us that he doesn't have enough information to say, uh, whether uh, he can properly audit this organization, specifically as to whether CSEC might be violating its own charter in terms of spying on Canadians. This is a serious issue that I think rises to the level of, uh, of some kind of independent commission needs to be called in this country as to what exactly is going on 
Uh, we're spending a lot of taxpayer money to fund an organization that has enormous power and capabilities. And given what's gone on in the United States, and the fact that this agency of ours has been closely twinned with the National Security Agency going back to at least 1946, should give all Canadians pause. In this regard, I am entirely in agreement with Byron when he said earlier, as well as Michael Geist. I, I think this really is something that we need to examine from the ground up, not to hamper what they do. Uh, they need to do a good job. Uh, no one doubts that, but to make sure that protections are in place against abuse of power at that level. Thanks. So, do you want to add something, Mr. Vanier? Well, it's, it's clear it's a governance uh, issue. Uh, who do they report to? who uh, oversee uh, their daily work. Uh, it has to be uh, an independent body of some kind. Uh, what's the best formula? I mean, uh, in the US they have senatorial committees uh, to oversee those uh, special agencies. Let's call them like that. Thank you very much. I have time for one last question, so maybe Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for the chance to ask my question. I'm really a novice here. This is my first time to attend a session like this. Uh, and I'm really fascinated by, in fact, today it seems to me that we went this morning and this afternoon on two aspects of the same big question. One is the multi, what do you call it here, the multi-stakeholder model model of the internet where we expect that we can do a lot of exploration on the internet and be free to do so and be secure in doing it. And this afternoon when we're hearing about uh, the threat to all of that from criminal organizations and from governments, basically those two gangs, plus also we knew already that the, uh, the private sector was involved in that when you think you know, about Google searching our email and that sort of stuff. Uh, the five-year question, it's kind of interesting to, to, I don't know much about technology, but I've heard description of the new kind of um, computer that's on the way with quantum, um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, quantum Thank what, <laughs> quantum physics of some kind, where the processes will be completely different. Uh, it's already now possible to, with the current technology that we have, break passwords that are 64 characters long in seconds, whereas we thought, thought before, uh, just recently, that 12 characters was pretty good. And knowing that all those encryption technologies that we depended on are now broken and open and used, and that breaking was done by governments, maybe, uh, this is may maybe a question, maybe it's uh, useful for CIRA to take on uh, the kind of thing that you're talking about to start to put together the sort of forum that we need to examine all these issues together uh, to start the discussion that has to take place in the public because myself, I wouldn't know where else to go. <laughs> so I'm wondering if this might not be something that uh, could be delegated to the, to the newly elected board to take on as a serious project. Uh, so someone want to jump on that is, uh, is the, the qubit, the, the quantum computer going to save uh, <laughs> the free speech in the future? Well, quantum computing won't solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Very often the problem is, is in front of the screen, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's human behavior. Why do people Absolutely. accept to give their bank account to receive an inherited $500,000 <laughs> I receive those every week. Uh, yeah. Human behavior has to change. It's not the power of computers will solve the problem. You, you have to assess uh, what are the risks, or what are the threats, what are the needs of the organization. The, the organization. It, there's no easy way to fix it. I don't think so. Yeah, the New York Times attack two weeks ago was kind of a low-tech attack. It wasn't really. A very high. It wasn't any tech at all. Yeah, fact, it it's was a just phone call. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it was a twenty-inch in front of the computer yeah. problem, kind mm -hmm. of. So, 
uh, we are at the end of this uh, panel. So thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Ron Diebert, Monsieur Frédéric Gaudreau, Monsieur uh, Matthew Johnson, and Monsieur Michel Vanier. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>